the Mercury Theater on the air. The Columbia Broadcasting System takes pleasure once again in bringing you Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air in the unique summer series which signalizes radio's first presentation of a complete theatrical producing company. In tonight's performance, the sixth in a group of nine weekly broadcasts, the regular CBS stations are joined by a coast-to-coast -coast network of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Here is Orson Welles himself, the director of the Mercury Theatre, star and producer of these programs, to tell you about tonight's play. Mr. Welles. Wherever you are in the world, an hour and a half from now, there will come to you through these same radio facilities the voice of the President of the United States. Until then, here is another President. His words, at least, which on Monday, August the 15th, 1938, are still entirely alive. And his person, preserved in a fine and very famous play. His words we have collected for this broadcast from many sources from letters and speeches, debates and proclamations, and from the written record of his own private conversation. They amount to a testament of his abiding faith in this, our land of the free. Much of it you will recognize, and much of it is as new as though this microphone were in the White House tonight. February 12th, 1809, in Hardin County, Kentucky. My parents were both in Virginia, undistinguished families, second families, perhaps I should say. My mother, who died in my tenth year, was of a family of the name of Hanks, some of whom now reside in Macon County, Illinois. My paternal grandfather emigrated from Rockingham County, Virginia, to Kentucky, where a year or two later he was killed by the Indians. When I came of age, somehow I could read, write, and cipher to the rule of three. That was all. I have not been to school since. Little advance I now have upon this store of education I've picked up from time to time under the pressure of necessity. I was raised to farm work, which I continued till I was 22. 21, I came to New Salem, where I remained a year as a sort of clerk in a store. Then came the Black Hawk War, and I was elected a captain of the Volunteers, a success which gave me more pleasure than any I've had since. From 1849 to 1854, I practiced law in Springfield. What I've done since then is pretty well known. If any personal description of me is thought desirable, it may be said I am in height six feet four inches, nearly and lean in flesh, Weighing on an average 180 pounds, dark complexion with coarse black hair and gray eyes. No other marks or brands recollected. Yours truly, Abraham Lincoln. Gentlemen, you said this was a great evening for me. It is. And I'll say more than I mostly do, because it is. I'm likely to go into history now with a great man. For now I know better than any how great he is. I'm plain looking, and I have a sharp tongue. And I have a mind that doesn't always go in his easy, high way. And that's what history will see, and it will laugh a little and say, Poor Abe Lincoln. That's all right, but it's not all. I've always known when he should go forward and when he should hold back. I've watched and watched. There are women like that, lots of them. But I'm lucky. My work's going farther than Illinois. It's going farther than any of us can tell. I made things easy for him to sink and sink when we were poor. And now his thinking is brought into this. 
they wanted to make him governor of Oregon. And he would have gone and have come to nothing there. I stopped him. Now they're coming from Chicago, from the Republican convention there, to ask him to be president. And I've told him to go. Um, it's a great place for a man to fill. You know, it's hard to believe. When I think of the times I've sat in this room of an evening and seen your husband come in, ma'am, with his battered hat and tie falling off the back of his head hmm. and stuffed with papers that won't go into his pockets and God darning some rascal who'd done him about an assignment or a trespass, why... I can't think he's gone up there into the eyes of the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do, Samuel. I do, Timothy. Good evening, Abraham. Good evening, Abraham. Well, we'll be going. We only came in to give you good fairing, so to say. Great word you've got to speak this evening. Makes a humble body almost afraid of himself, Abraham, to know his friend is to be one of the great ones of the earth. With his yes and no... Law for these many, many thousands of folk. Makes a man humble to be chosen so, Samuel. So humble that no man but would say no to such bidding, if he dare. To be president of this people. And trouble gathering everywhere in men's hearts. And the searching thing. Bitterness and scorn and wrestling often with men I shall despise and perhaps... Nothing cruelly done at the end. But I must go. Samuel, Timothy, just grasp that cordial, Mary, before they leave. Yeah. Well, may the devil smudge that girl, Susan. Susan Deddington, where's that darnation cordial? It's all right, Abraham. I told the girl to keep it out. Oh, the cupboard's choked with papers. There you are. Boy, hard to tell a day for whiskey-drinking rascals like yourselves, but the thought's good. Oh, don't mention it, Abraham. <laughs> we wish you well, Abraham. Our compliments, ma'am. Mm. Samuel, I give you the United States of America and Abraham Lincoln. Thank you. Samuel, Timothy, I drink to the hope of honest friends. Mary, the friendship... I'll need that always, for I have a queer, anxious heart. Give you the United States of America. Well, good night, Abraham. Good night, ma'am. Good night. Good night, ma'am. Good night, Mr. Stone. Good night, Mr. Cotton. Good night, Samuel. Good night, Timothy. Thanks for coming. You'd better see them in here. Five minutes to seven. Yeah. Sure about it, Mary? Yes. Aren't you? We mean to set bonds to slavery. The South will resist. They may try to break away from the Union. If the Union is set aside, America will crumble. Saving of it may mean blood. Who is to shape it all if you don't? There's nobody. I know it. Then go. Go. The gentlemen have come. I'll come to them. I'll send them in. Abraham, I believe in you. I know. I know. entitled to all the natural rights enumerated in the Declaration of Independence. The right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I hold that he is as much entitled to these as the white man, and the right to eat the bread without the leave of anybody else which his own hand earns. He is my equal, and the equal of every living man. November 
six, 1860. Republican Party, 180 out of 303 electoral votes. 1,857,000 out of 4,645,000 popular votes. Lincoln, elected president. Fellow citizens of the Senate and House of Representatives, this issue the right of secession embraces more than the fate of these United States. It presents to the whole family of men the question whether a constitutional republic or democracy, a government of the people by the same people, can or cannot maintain its territorial integrity against its own domestic forces. It presents the question whether discontented individuals, too few in numbers to control administration, can always, upon the pretenses or arbitrarily without any pretense, break up their government and thus practically put an end the free government upon the earth. Is there, in all republics, this inherent and fatal weakness? Must the government of necessity be too strong for the liberties of its own people, or too weak to maintain its own existence? common feeling in the South, Mr. Seward, that as Secretary of State, you are the one man here at Washington to see this thing with large imagination. I say this with no disrespect to the President, but what does his experience of great affairs of state amount to beside yours, Mr. Seward? My support of the President is, of course, unquestionable, Mr. Jennings. Oh, Entirely. But how can your support be more valuable than in lending him your unequaled understanding? You understand, of course, that I can say nothing officially. But these are nothing but informal suggestions. But I may tell you that I am not unsympathetic. I was sure that uh, that would be so. Yes, come in. The president is coming up the stairs, sir. Thank you. This is unfortunate. Say nothing and go at once. Here he is. Good morning, Mr. Seward. Good morning, Mr. Jennings. Good morning, Mr. President. And um, I am obliged to you for calling, Mr. Jennings. Uh, good morning. Perhaps Mr. Jennings could spare me ten minutes. It, uh, Say five uh, minutes. I'm anxious always for any opportunity to exchange views with our friends of the South. Much enlightenment may be gained in five minutes. Excuse I beg you, Mr. Seward will allow us. Oh, by all means. Uh, shall I leave you? Leave us, but why? I may want your support, Mr. Secretary, if we should not wholly agree. Well, Mr. Jennings, you have messages for us. Uh, Mr. Jennings, in his anxiety for peace, was merely seeking the best channel through which uh, suggestions could be made. To whom? Uh, to the government. The head of the government is here. But, uh, Tom, uh, sir, what is it? It's this matter of Fort Sumter, Mr. President. Yes? If you withdraw your garrison from Fort Sumter... It won't be looked upon as weakness in you. We believe that the South at heart does not want secession. It wants to establish the right to decide for itself. The South wants the stamp of national approval upon slavery. Can't have it. Mr. President, if I may say so, you don't quite understand. Does Mr. Seward understand? I believe so. You are wrong. He doesn't understand because you didn't mean him to. I don't blame you. You think you're acting for the best. You think you've got an honest case, but I'll put your case for you, and I'll put it naked. Many people in this country want abolition. Many don't. But every man, whether he wants it or not, knows it may come. Why does the South propose secession? Because it knows abolition may come, and it wants to avoid it. I said the other day that Fort Sumter would be held as long as we could hold it. 
I said it because I know exactly what it means. I see how it is. You may force freedom as much as you like, but we are to beware how we force slavery. Couldn't be put better, Mr. Jennings. That's what the union means. It is a union that stands for common right. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, do not allow it to break our bonds of affection. That is our answer. Tell them that. Will you tell them that? You are determined? I beg you to tell them. It shall be as you wish. Implore them to order your troops return. You can telegraph it now from here. Will you do that? If you wish it. But it will do no good, Mr. Lincoln. They won't give way. It's a grave decision. Terribly grave. For all of us. Good morning, Mr. Jennings. <clears throat> so this won't go. You don't suspect, Mr. I do not, but let us be plain. No man can say how wisely, but Providence has brought me to the leadership of this country with a task before me greater than that which rested on Washington himself. When I made my cabinet, you were the first man I chose. I do not regret it. I think I never shall. But remember, faith earns faith. What is it? Why didn't this man come to see me? He thought my word might bear more weight with you than his. Your word for what? Discretion about Fort Sumter. Discretion? It's devastating, this thought of civil war. It is. You think I'm less sensible of that than you. War should be impossible. But you can only make it impossible by destroying its causes. If we withdraw from Fort Sumter, we do nothing to destroy that cause. We can only destroy it by convincing the southern states that secession is a betrayal of their trust. Please, God, we may do so. Has there perhaps been some timidity in making all this clear to the country? Timidity? You are talking of discretion. I mean that perhaps our policy has not been sufficiently defined. And have you not concurred in all our decisions? So, as you may think I'm simple, but I can see your mind working as plainly as you might see the innards of a clock. You can bring great gifts to this government with your zeal and your administrative experience and your love of men... Don't spoil it by thinking I've got a dull brain. Yes, I see. I've not been thinking quite clearly about it all. Mr. President, I beg your pardon. Well, that's brave of you. Give me your hand. Come in. There's a messenger from Major Anderson, sir. He's ridden straight from Fort Sumter. All right, Hay, bring him in. Yes, sir. Don't like the sound of it. One moment, Hay. Yes, sir. Are there any gentlemen of the cabinet in the house? Uh, Mr. Chase and Mr. Blair, I believe. My compliments to them, and will they be prepared to see me here at once if necessary? Send the same message to any other cabinet members you can find. Yes, sir. So, Ed, we may have to decide now. Now. Come in. Are you the messenger from Fort Sumter? Yes, sir. Word of mouth, sir. Well... Major Anderson presents his duty to the government. He can hold the fort three days more without provisions and reinforcements. Are uh, things very bad at the fort? The Major says three days, sir. Most of us would have said 24 hours. I see. Thank you. Wait outside, please. Yes, sir. Three days, Stuart, three days. My God... My God, Seward, we need great courage, great faith. There is a tide in the affairs of men. Did you read Shakespeare, Seward? Shakespeare? No. Uh. Uh, the cabinet is here, sir. Mr. Chase, Mr. Hook, and Mr. Wells. Show them in. Yes, sir. Good day, Mr. President. Good morning, Good morning, Mr. Wells, Mr. Hook. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Good morning Mr. President. How do you do, Mr. Seward? Something urgent? Let us be seated. <clears throat> Gentlemen, we meet in a crisis the most fateful, perhaps, that has ever faced any government in this country. It can be stated briefly, a message has just come from Anderson. He can hold Fort Sumter three days at most unless we send men and provisions. Mr. President, 
I consider that we should withdraw. Don't you see that to withdraw may postpone war, but that it will make it inevitable in the end? It is inevitable if we resist. I fear it will be so, but in that case, we shall enter it with uncompromised principles. Mr. Chase? It is difficult, but on the whole, my opinion is with yours, Mr. President. You, Seward? I respect your opinion, but I must differ. I charge you, all of you, to weigh this thing with all your understanding. To temporize now cannot, in my opinion, avert war. To speak plainly to the world and standing by our resolution to hold Fort Sumter with all our means and in a plain declaration that the Union must be preserved will leave us with a clean cause, simply and loyally supported. I tremble at the thought of war. But we have in our hands a sacred trust. It is threatened. Persuasion has failed. And I conceive it to be our duty to resist. To withhold surprise from Fort Sumter would, would be to deny that duty. Gentlemen. Gentlemen, the matter is before you. For sending men and provisions to Fort Sumter. Three. For immediate withdrawal. Five. Gentlemen, I may have to take upon myself the responsibility of overriding your vote. It will be for me to satisfy Congress and public opinion. Should I receive any resignations? Thank you for your consideration. Will you send in that messenger? Yes, sir. You sent for me, Mr. President? I did. Can you ride back to Fort Sumter at once? Yes, sir. Tell Major Anderson that we cannot reinforce him immediately. We haven't the men. Yes, sir. Say that the first convoy of supplies will leave Washington this evening. Yes, sir. Thank you. Whereas the laws of the United States have been for some time past and now are opposed, and the execution thereof obstructed in the states of South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas by combinations too powerful to be suppressed by the ordinary course of judicial proceedings or by the powers vested in the marshals by law. Now, therefore, I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, in virtue of the power in me vested by the Constitution and the laws, have thought fit to call forth and do hereby call forth militia of the several states of the Union to the number of 75,000 in order to suppress their combinations and to cause the laws to be duly executed. You are listening to Orson Welles as Abraham Lincoln in Columbia's presentation of the Mercury Theater on the Air. The broadcast is an adaptation of John Drinkwater's Abraham Lincoln with original Lincoln speeches. The drama will continue in just a moment. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. We continue now with the performance of John Drinkwater's Abraham Lincoln by Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air. Fellow citizens of the Senate and the House of Representatives, the war continues, and it continues to develop that the insurrection is largely, if not exclusively, a war upon the first principle of popular government, the rights of the people. It is not needed nor fitting here that a general argument should be made in favor of popular institutions, but there is one point to which I ask a brief attention. It is assumed that labor is available only in connection with capital, that nobody labors unless somebody else owning capital somehow by the use of it induces him to labor. This assumed, it is next considered whether it is best that capital shall hire laborers and thus induce them to work by their own consent or buy them and drive them to it without their consent. 
I haven't proceeded that far. It is naturally concluded that all laborers are either hired laborers or what we call slaves. And further, it is assumed that whoever is once a hired laborer is fixed in that condition for life. Now, there is no such relation between capital and labor as assumed. Nor is there any such thing as a free man being fixed for life in the condition of a hired laborer. Both these assumptions are false, and all inferences from them are groundless. Labor is prior to and independent of capital. Capital is only the fruit of labor and could never have existed if labor had not first existed. No men living are more worthy to be trusted than these who toil up from poverty. Let them beware of surrendering a political power which they already possess and which, if surrendered, will surely be used to close the door of advancement against such as they and to fix new disabilities and burdens upon them. The law of liberty shall be lost. Good morning, gentlemen. Mm. I've just had my summons. Is there some special news? Yes. McClellan has defeated Lee at Antietam. It's our greatest success. They ought not to recover from it. The tide is turning. Have you seen the president, Mrs. Stanton? I've just been with him. Well, what does he say? He only said at last. He's coming directly. Uh, he'll bring up his proclamation again. In my opinion, it's inopportune. I thought we had learned by now that the president is the best man among us. There's a good deal of feeling against him everywhere, I find. He is the one man with character enough for this business. There are other opinions. Yes, but not here, surely, Mr. Hook. It's not for me to say, but there are some who would have acted differently. And you may depend upon it that they would not have acted so wisely, Mr. Hook. I don't altogether agree with the president. But he's the only man I should agree with at all. No. Uh, is Lee's army broken? Not yet. But it is in grave danger. Why doesn't the president come when well, think this news was nothing? I must say I'm anxious to know what he has to say about it all. And I shall oppose it if it comes up. He may say nothing about it. I think he will. Uh, gentlemen, the president. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Good morning Mr. President. Mr. President. Good morning. Great news we hear. If we leave things with the army now to take that course... Why, we ought to see through our difficulties. An exciting morning, gentlemen. I feel rather excited myself. I find my mind not at its best in excitement. Would you allow me to read you something? It's not long, and it may compose us all. It is Artemis Ward's latest. High-handed outrage at Utica. In the fall of 1856, I showed my show in Utica, a truly great city in the state of New York. People gave me a cordial reception. The press was loud in her praises. One day I was given a description of my beasts and snakes in my usual flowery style, when what was my consternation, and so in my cage containing my wax figures of the Lord's Last Supper, I says, but up comes a fellow and sees Judas Iscariot by the feet and drag him out on the ground. He then commenced for to pound him as hard as he could. What under the sun are you about, cried I, says he, what did you bring this pussy Larnimus cuss here for? And he hit the wax figure another tremendous blow on the head. Says I, you egregious ass, that is a wax figure. Representation of the false apostle. Says he, that's all very well for you to say, but I tell you, old man, that Judas Iscariot can't show himself in Utica with importunity by a downside, with which operation he caved in Judas's head. Young man belonged to one of the first families in Utica. I sued him, and the jury brought in a verdict of arson in the third degree. <laughs> Gentlemen, and... Uh, <laughs> I'd give up office if I could write like that. May we now consider affairs of state? Yes, we may. Mr. Hook says, yes, we may. Thank you. Oh, no. Thank Mr. Hook. And McClellan is in pursuit of Lee, I suppose. You suppose a good deal, but for the first time, McClellan has the chance of being in pursuit of Lee, and that's the first sign of their end. If McClellan doesn't take his chance, we'll move Grant down to the job. Grant drinks. Well, then tell me the name of his brand. I'll send him some barrels. He wins victories. Is there any other business? There is. Some weeks ago, I showed you a draft I made proclaiming freedom for all slaves. You thought then it was not the time to issue it. I agreed. I think now the moment has come. I will read it. Here it is again. 
is proclaimed that on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. I must oppose the issue of such a proclamation at this moment in the most unqualified terms. I do not quite understand, Mr. President, why you think this the precise moment. Believe me, gentlemen, I have considered this matter with all the earnestness and understanding of which I am capable. But when the New York Tribune urged you to come forward with a clear declaration six months ago, you rebuked them. Because I thought the occasion not the right one. My duty, it has seemed to me, has been to be loyal to a principle and not to betray it by expressing in action at the wrong time. That is why I conceive statesmanship. For long now, I've had two fixed resolves. To preserve the Union and to abolish slavery. How to preserve the Union, I was always clear. And more than two years of bitterness have not dulled my vision. We have fought for the Union, and we are now winning for the Union. With that victory and a vindicated Union will come abolition. I made the promise to myself and to my maker. The rebel army is now driven out, and I'm going to fulfill that promise. I do not wish your advice about the main matter, but that I've determined for myself. This is, I say, without intending anything but respect for any one of you. But I beg you to stand with me in this thing. Well, in my opinion, it's altogether too impetuous. One other observation I will make. I know very well that others might in this matter, as in others do better than I can. And if I was satisfied that the public confidence was more fully possessed by any one of them than by me, or know of any constitutional way in which he could be put in my place, he should have it. I would gladly yield it to him. But though I cannot claim undivided confidence, I do know that all things considered, any other person has more. This I do not know, and moreover this may be, there is no way in which I can have any other man put where I am. I am here. I must do the best I can and bear the responsibility of taking the course which I feel I ought to take. Could this be left over for a short time for consideration? I feel that we should remember that our only public cause at the at the moment is the preservation of the Union. I entirely agree with Wells. Gentlemen, we cannot escape history. We of this administration will be remembered in spite of ourselves. In giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free. We shall nobly save or meanly lose the last best hope on earth. I shall sign this proclamation now. Excuse me, gentlemen. For we, thenceforward and forever free. Gentlemen, I pray for your support. Good day. Good day, sir. Good day. Good day, Mr. President. Hawk. Yes, Mr. President. Hawk, will you stay a moment? Yes, Mr. President. Hawk, one cannot help hearing things. I beg your pardon? Hawk, there's a way some people have when a man says a disagreeable thing of asking him to repeat it, hoping to embarrass him. It's often effective, but I'm not easily embarrassed. I said one cannot help hearing things. And I do not understand what you mean, Mr. President. Come, Hook, we're alone. Lincoln is a good enough name, and I think you understand. How should I? Then plainly there are intrigues going on. Against the government? No. In it. Against me. Well, criticism, perhaps. To what end? To better my ways? I presume that might be the purpose. Then why am I not told what it is? I imagine it's a natural compunction. Or ambition. What do you mean? Hawk, you've been bitten by the White House bug. You think you ought to be in my place. You're well informed. You cannot imagine why everyone does not see that you ought to be in my place. I what right you say that? It is not true. You take me unprepared. You have me at a disadvantage. You speak as a very scrupulous man, Hook. You question my honor? As you will. Then I resign. As a protest against... Your suspicion. This false? Very well. I'll be frank. I mistrust your judgment, Mr. Lincoln. In what? Generally, you overemphasize abolition. You don't mean that. You mean that you fear possible public feeling against abolition? It must be persuaded, not forced. Besides, you have, in my opinion, failed in necessary firmness in telling the South 
What will be the individual penalties of rebellion? This is war. I will not allow it to become a blood feud. But we are fighting treason. We must meet it with severity. We will defeat treason. I will meet it with conciliation. It is a policy of weakness. It is a policy of faith. It is a policy of compassion. Hook. Hook, why do you plague me with these jealousies? Once before I found a member of my cabinet working behind my back, but he was disinterested and he made amends. Nobly. But, Hook, you have allowed the burden of these days to sour you. I know it all. I've watched you plotting and plotting for authority, and I, who am a, a lonely man, and sick at heart. So great is the task God has given to my hand, and so few are my days, and my deepest hunger is always for loyalty in my own house. You have withheld it from me. You have done great service in your office, but you have grown envious. Now you resign as you did once before when I came openly to you in friendship. And you think that again I shall flatter you and coax you to stay. I won't do it. Let's take you at your word. I am content. Will you shake hands? No. I beg you... To excuse me. Yes, Mr. President? Mr. Hay. Yes, sir. Mr. Hay, I'm rather tired today. Read to me a little. I certainly sir. The Tempest. You know the passage. Our revels now are ended. These, our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life that the fourth day of April, 1865, be the day for a general movement of all the land and naval forces of the United States against the insurgent forces. That especially the Army of the Potomac, the Army of Western Virginia, the Army near Munfordville, Kentucky, the Army and Flotilla at Cairo, and a naval force in the Gulf of Mexico be ready to move on that day. Grant. Yes, Dennis. 7.30, sir. Uh, an hour and a half. Ought to be something more from Meade by now, Dennis. Yes, sir. Have you wired the president? Yes, sir. Take these papers to Captain Tupperman. Ask Colonel West if the 23rd are in action yet. Tell the cook to send some soup at 10 o'clock. It was cold yesterday. Yes, sir. Give me that map, Maitlands. Yes. There's no doubt about it. Unless Meade goes to sleep, it can only be a question of hours. He's a great man, but he can't get out of that. It's all of the end, sir? Yes. If Lee surrenders, we can all pack up for home. I guess it'll be splendid, won't it, to be back again? By God, sir, it will. I beg your pardon, sir. Ah, you're quite right, Maylands. My boy goes away to school next week. Now I may be able to go down with him, see him settle. Uh, well, Dennis? Colonel West says yes, sir, for the last half hour. The cook says he's sorry, sir. It was a mistake. Tell him to keep his mistakes in the kitchen. I will, sir. His rifles went up this afternoon. Yes, sir. Oh! What's that? General Grant. What is it? The president has just arrived, sir. He's in the yard now. Oh, all right, I'll come. General Grant? What 
wasn't expecting you, sir. No, I couldn't keep away. How's it going? Meade sent word an hour and a half ago that Lee was surrounded all but two miles, which was closing in. I know about settling, eh? Unless anything goes wrong in those two miles, sir. I'm expecting a further report from Meade every minute. Would there be more fighting? It'll probably mean fighting through the night, more or less. But Lee must realize it's hopeless by the morning. Dispatch, sir. Yes. General Meade, sir. Thank you. You needn't wait. Yes, they've closed the ring. Meade gives them ten hours. Timed at eight. That's six o'clock in the morning. We must be merciful. Bob Lee has been a gallant fellow. Uh, perhaps you'll look through this list, sir. I hope it's the last we shall have. It's a horrible part of the business, Grant. Any shootings? Uh, one. Damn it, Grant. Why can't you do without it? Oh, no. No, of course not. Who is it? Jim Scott says it's rather a hard case. And what is it? Just on a heavy march, sir, and volunteered for double guard duty to relieve a sick friend. He was found asleep at his post. I was anxious to spare him, but it couldn't be done. It was a critical place at a gravely critical time. When is it to be? Tomorrow at daybreak, sir. I don't see that it'll do him any good to be shot. Where is he? In the barn, I believe, sir. Thanks. I think I'll go see him. I go with you, sir? No, thank you. Is this where the boy is held? Oh, uh, uh, yes, Mr. President. Wait outside, William. Yes. Are you William Scott? Yes, sir. Know who I am? Yes, Mr. Lincoln. General tells me you've been court-martialed. Yes, sir. Asleep on guard? Yes, sir. It's a very serious offense. I know, sir. What was it? I couldn't keep awake, sir. It's had a long march. Twenty-three miles, sir. Doing double guard? Yes, sir. Who ordered you? Well, sir, I... I offered. Why? Enoch White. He, he was sick, sir. We... Come from the same place. Where's that? Vermont, sir. You live there? Yes, sir. I, yeah, you've got a farm down there, sir. Who has? My mother, sir. I, I've got her photograph, sir. I, Does she know about this? Oh, for God's sake, don't, sir. I, there, there. There, my boy. There. You're not going to be shot. Not going to be shot, sir? No, no. Not going to be shot? There, there. I believe you when you tell me you couldn't keep awake. I'm going to trust you. Send you back to your regiment. When may I go back, sir? We won't go back tomorrow. Expect the fighting to be over, though. Is it over yet, sir? Not quite. Oh, please, sir. Let me go back tonight. Let me go back tonight. Very well. You know where General Meade is? No, sir. Is that guard to come here? Your prisoner is discharged. Take him once to General Meade with this. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Lincoln. Mr. Hay. Yes, sir? That's the time, Mr. Hay. Uh, just on half past nine, sir. Well, to sleep here for a little, you'd better shake down to him. They'll wake us if any news.
Hello. Uh, what the devil is it? I... Oh, I beg your pardon, Mr. Lincoln. Not at all. Slept well, hey? Well, I... I feel a little crumpled, sir. <laughs> What's the time? Uh, six o'clock, sir. Listen. I don't hear anything, Mr. Lincoln. I sure did. Guns have stopped. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Hay. Good morning, General. I didn't disturb you last night. A message has come from Meade. Lee asked for an armistice at four o'clock. An armistice? Yes, sir. An armistice? For four years, life has been but the hope of this moment. It's strange how simple it is when it comes. Grant, you served the country very truly. Made my work possible, thank you. And I feel the fault would not have been yours, sir. I succeeded because you believed in me. Where is Lee? He's coming here. Meade should arrive directly. Where will Lee wait? There's a room ready for him. Will you receive him, sir? No, no, Grant. No, that's your affair. To mention no political matters. Be generous. I... Didn't say that. I have written out the terms I suggest. Here they are, sir. Yeah. Yes, me. I do your honor. General Meade is here, sir. Ask him to come here. Yes, sir. I learned a good deal from Robert Lee in early days. He's a better man than most of us. This business will go pretty near his heart, sir. Glad it's to be done by a brave gentleman, Grant. Oh, congratulations, Meade. You've done well. Thank you, sir. Was there much more fighting? Pretty hot for an hour or two. How long will Lee be? Only a few minutes, I should say, sir. You said nothing about terms. No, sir. Did a boy named Scott come to you? Yes, sir. He went into action at once. He was killed. Killed? It's a queer world, Grant. Is there any proclamation to be made, sir, about the rebels? I hope There will that... be no persecution, no bloody work after this war is over. I'll have nothing of hanging or shooting these men, even the worst of them. Frighten them out of the country, open the gates, let down the bars, scare them off, shoo. Enough lives have been sacrificed. Goodbye, Grant. Port at Washington as soon as you can. Mr. President. Yes? Is it known that you return to Washington tomorrow? I think so. Mr. President, I think you take too many risks. On the way here yesterday, you must have passed half a dozen places where a well-directed bullet might have taken you off. Assassination of public officers is not an American crime. Goodbye, gentlemen. Come along, hey. Goodbye, Mr. President. Who is with Lee? Only one of his staff, sir. Dennis, let us know directly General Lee comes. Yes, sir. Well, Meade, it's been a big job. Yes, sir. We've had courage and determination. We've had wits to beat a great soldier. I'd say that to any man. But it's Abraham Lincoln, Meade, who has kept us a great cause clean to fight for. It does a man's heart good to know he's given victory to such a man to handle. Have a drink, Meade? No? <laughs> you know me, there were fools who wanted me to oppose Lincoln for the presidency. Yes, sir. What? General Lee is here, sir. Me, will General Lee do me the honor of meeting me in here? Where did you my hat, Dennis, for sore? Yes, sir. General Lee, sir. You have given me occasion to be proud of my opponent. I have not spared my strength. I acknowledge its defeat. You have come, General Lee, to ask upon what terms you will accept surrender. Yes. They are simple. I hope you will not find them ungenerous. Here they are.
You are magnanimous, sir. May I make one submission? It would be a privilege if I could consider it. You allow our officers to keep their horses, General Grant. That is gracious. Our cavalry troopers' horses also are their own. I understand. They'll be needed on the farms. It shall be done. I thank you. I accept your terms. touched by this mark of your goodwill. After four dark and difficult years, we have achieved the great purpose for which we set out. I have but little to say at this moment. I claim not to have controlled events, but confess plainly that events have controlled me. But as events have come before me, I have seen them always with one faith. We have preserved the American Union. We have abolished a great wrong. The task of reconciliation, of setting order where there is now confusion, of bringing about a settlement at once just and merciful and of directing the life of a reunited country into prosperous channels of goodwill and generosity will demand all our wisdom, all our loyalty. It is the proudest hope of my life that I may be of some service in this work. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. April 14th, 1865. In the morning, there was a cabinet meeting at the White House. Lincoln was in a happy mood. He told Grant and the cabinet of a dream he had dreamed, which had come to him several times before. In this dream, whenever it came, he was sailing in a ship of a peculiar build, indescribable but always the same, and being borne on it with great speed toward the dark and undefined shore. He had always dreamed this before a victory. He dreamed it before Antietam, before Murfreesboro, before Gettysburg, before Vicksburg. In the afternoon, Mr. and Mrs. Lincoln drove together 
And he talked to her of the life they would lead back in Springfield, Illinois, when this presidency was over. That night, Mr. and Mrs. Lincoln went to Ford's Theater. The theater was crowded. Many officers returned from the war were there and eager to see Lincoln. The play was our American cousin. A little after 8 o'clock, Mrs. Abraham Lincoln entered the official box with her husband and their guests following. Sometime after 10 o'clock, at a point in the play which no person present could afterwards remember, a shot was heard in the theater, and Abraham Lincoln fell forward upon the front of the box, unconscious and dying. He was carried to a house near the theater. His sons and closest friends were summoned. A dismal drizzle of rain was falling as the dawn came to Washington after a night of terror. In the streets, men stood in groups discussing the tragedy. Then at 7.30, a tolling of all the church bells in the town and a hush in the streets. Lincoln was dead. in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. the Columbia Broadcasting System through its affiliated stations coast to coast and the network of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation has brought you a production of Abraham Lincoln by Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre on the Air. The famous play by John Drinkwater was supplemented by many of Lincoln's speeches, excerpts from his debates, proclamations, letters, and accounts of his own private conversations. In the cast this evening were Ray Collins as General Grant, Ed Jerome as General Lee, George Kalouris as Hook, Joseph Holland as Seward, Carl Frank as Scott, Carl Swenson as Hay, William Allen as Dennis, Agnes Moorhead as Mrs. Lincoln, and Orson Welles as Abraham Lincoln. Bernard Herman conducted. Dan Seymour speaking. Davidson Taylor supervised for the Columbia Network. Next week at this same time, Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air will bring you Schnitzler's Viennese romance, The Affairs of Anatole. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.